welcome to Hope City Online. You're about to hear a message that's part of our series here at Hope City. Check it out and consider joining us in person on Sundays. Our vision for you is that you would have a thriving relationship with Jesus, that you would know Him, you would find community and discover your purpose as you prioritize your relationship with God. So get in touch with us at hopecity.my slash hello for more details and subscribe to our Hope City Cal YouTube and podcast channels so you don't miss out any of our future content. Enjoy this message from our lead pastor, Joe Burden. Hey everyone, so good to have you joining us today. My name is Joel, I'm the pastor here, and we're continuing our series today on Loveology, all about the study of love, dating, sex, relationships, marriage. We're diving into what the Bible says about these topics. And this is a really great time for you to jump in and hear God's wisdom on this subject, you know, because relationships can cause so much pain, they can also bring so much joy and our heart through all of this as a church is we want to help you use your relationships, love, sex, singleness, marriage in a way that honors God and hopefully brings you less pain and heartache and way more joy and fulfillment and satisfaction. And so that's our heart behind this. And I just want to point to one resource. There's a book called Loveology by John Mark Comer. If you want to go a little bit deeper on this journey, uh, maybe today some stuff that we're going to bring up is going to talk to you in a way that's a little bit deeper than everyone else. You can obviously go grab this book and just go a deep dive on this topic. And so I'd really recommend this resource, Fantastic Theology of Relationships, Sex, Love, Marriage. Um, and that will really help you out. Hey, let me open up with this verse here today as we come to talk about sex. Yes, I said sex, a pastor talking about sex. I hope this does not come back in 20 years to embarrass me or ruin my life, but I'm gonna speak to you today about sex. And the title of the message is actually Good Sex. And let me read this verse to you here from Genesis 1 chapter sorry, chapter one, verse 31. It says that God saw all that he had made and it was very good, very good. God saw everything that he'd made and it was very good. You know, the Hebrew word there for good or very good is tob. And tob is a beautiful word. It's a lot more expressive and uh, beautiful in the original language than our English. The word here is to do with all the human senses. It's to do with touch, to do with taste, to do with smell, sight. In the Bible, the word tob here is used to describe freshly baked bread, that beautiful smell, the home, a place of comfort, a feast on a table, the shade under a cool tree, on a hot summer's day. All of those things are what the Bible calls tobe. <clears throat> and it's describing things that are pleasant, joyful, and lovely. The smell of fresh air is tobe. The taste and smell of sweet, ripe fruit is tobe. The embrace of someone close to you is tobe. And perhaps surprisingly, for many Christians, the Bible talks a lot about sex. It talks about sex as tobe, because God saw everything that he had made, the mountains, the sunsets, the rivers, the streams, the human body, yes, even sex in the beginning in creation is described as tobe. This is beauty, affection, the touch of a lover, the kiss of a mouth. All of it is described as tobe. And it might not be the word that you would think of that God uses to describe sex because he made it all, but he calls it very good. And the reason this is surprising to us is I think because we misunderstand who God is. Sometimes as Christians, we have a mental image of God as being like a stern old man who doesn't want anyone to have fun, who doesn't like people being happy and he wants to steal all of our joy. Nothing could be further from the truth. God in creation made a beautiful world before sin and it was good, it was very good. It was filled with pleasure and delight. And we can see this in Jesus. Actually, if you think about who Jesus is, the visible image of the invisible God, he was a God of joy. 
He wasn't just turning over tables, he was laughing, he was dancing. The uh, people in his time actually misunderstood Jesus. They called him a, a drunken and a glutton. Why? Because he was eating so much food and he was at so many parties and he was smiling. Think about it this way, the very first miracle that Jesus ever performed. Think about this, you're the son of man, what's the first miracle you wanna do to show the world who you are? Would you bring down thousands of angels from the sky? Would you crack open the world and let them see the glory of God? No, instead, Jesus' first miracle, think about what this says about his nature, he turns water into a thousand bottles of wine at a wedding. Like this is a God who wants us to know he's a God of life, he's a God of abundance, he's a God of joy. Anything to do with God originally in his creation is all about tobe, joy, life, laughter, and beauty. Don't misunderstand God. He's not absent of pleasure. He's not here to steal your joy. In him is fullness of life. In him is abundant life and abundant joy. He's the rivers of living water. In his presence is fullness of joy. And God was like that in the beginning and he is still like that today. Listen to this in 1 Timothy, this verse says, God richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Okay, so just backtrack if you've ever thought God is mean and stingy. He provides us with everything for our enjoyment. We have a, a theology of holiness. We have a theology of sin. I'm sure you've heard about that a lot in our preaching. I think we need a, a theology of enjoyment, of what God gave to us as the gifts that we could enjoy. And this has everything to do with how the Christian should approach and view and experience sex. Now, Emma and I, uh, we tried our very best to save sex for marriage. Uh, hey, hey to all the married couples out there. And that meant that the, the start of our married life was actually pretty fun. It was exhilarating. Uh, sex was probably a little bit clumsy and it took a little bit of time to get used to it, but it was intoxicating. It was beautiful, it was wonderful. And to be able to share that moment with your best friend and the person that you want to do life with, the person of your dreams, is just an incredible gift. And the good news is, for every married couple, it gets better and better and better. And God gave sex to us as a gift. To think about that, that God didn't want to steal from us joy, He didn't want to hold us back, but He actually gave us sex as a gift. You know, the very first command out of God's mouth was to be fruitful and multiply. The first command says something. It's like a priority. It's something that he's stating. Now, he is talking there about having children, but more than anything, he's talking about sex. Sex is for procreation, and most couples will have children, but really sex is a bond of intimacy. It's a friendship that can uh, put together two people. We're going to be talking about this next week, the power and, the, and the, the wonder of sex. And it was God's first command to be fruitful and multiply. The reason we're saying all of this today is because I'm aware that many of you, the message that you've heard from the church about sex is all negative and it's don't. And you've probably heard that in our church too and it's wise. Don't lust. Don't watch porn. Don't masturbate. Don't sleep around. And all of that is true and we'd be wise to put that into practice. But the Bible's message about sex never started on the negative. It started on the positive. It's true, it's beautiful, it's pure, it's something to delight in. And one of the first things we read about Adam and Eve is this. It says in the Bible in Genesis that they were naked and they felt no shame. Just imagine if you could start to think about sex and sexuality with no shame. Imagine how good it was when God originally intended it, before sin tainted it, before things got messed up. Sex without baggage. Sex without inhibition. Sex that is pure and delight, that has not been tainted and giving heartache. Just pure delight in a relationship that bonds between a man and a woman. That was God's intention when he created sex. Sex was created before the fall. So before we were sinful, we were already sexual and it was a good gift from God. I think the danger is if we only preach to you about the don't, and the negative and the pain and the heartache, we could get the idea that 
Sex is dirty and wrong, but nothing could be further from the truth. Sex is a good gift from God that we are invited to enjoy. If you don't believe me, let me go through a couple of Bible verses, which I'm sure you've stumbled over. Proverbs. I've been reading Proverbs recently. Listen how the father instructs the son in the, in the book of Proverbs. He says, rejoice in the wife of your youth, a lovely deer, a graceful doe. I don't know how Emma would feel if I called her a lovely deer, but there you go. A lovely deer, a graceful doe. Let her breasts fill you at all times with delight, be intoxicated with her love. There's a positive slant on intimacy between a married man and a woman. In the New Testament, it goes on to say, let marriage be held in honor among all and let the marriage bed be undefiled. In other words, sex between a man and a wife, it should never cause a conversation for shame or embarrassment. Instead, it should be honored and cherished as something pure and wonderful. And even in the New Testament, when Paul the Apostle speaks to married couples about sex, he's not all trying to stop them and slow them down and keep them separate. He's encouraging them. He's saying, go and have sex, go and have lots of sex regularly, generously. You can read about that too. There is even a whole book in the Bible uh, called Song of Solomon. I'm sure you've heard of it, Song of Songs. It's a strange, quite difficult to interpret poetic book all about a couple's really their sexual love together their desire for each other and a lot of commentators will try and talk about the allegory you know that this is an allegorical picture of Jesus and the church and it is and it's beautiful and that should be the ultimate goal of it but don't in the looking for the allegorical me meaning don't miss the literal meaning that this is literally a description a poem about a couple's sexual love and what I find amazing about when the Bible talks about sex is that it never comes across vulgar or crass. And I think this is so important. When we approach the topic of sex, so much of our understanding around sex has been from Hollywood, it's been from porn, it's been from dirty movies, it's been from shameful comedy or conversations. And that can create this idea that sex is dirty and shameful. But when the Bible talks about sex, it's in the positive. It's pure, it's delightful, which shows us that if only we could get God's heart, we could redeem sex for the gift that it should be to all of us. Here, the couple's love for each other is not interrupted or tinged. In the Song of Solomons, it's not tinged with baggage. It's not tinged with pain and heartache. It's a beautiful, wonderful gift, celebrated gift from God himself. So sadly, like everything else, here's, here's where we find our problem today. Sadly, like everything else God creates, sex can also be de defaced. It can be dysfunctional. We can change it from something pure and we can change it into something of shame. We don't have to look very far, just the world around us. Just scroll the internet for a few moments, watch some stuff on Netflix to see how far sex has fallen from God's purity, God's original intention, and all around us we see sex, probably also in your own life, causing pain and causing heartache. And to understand why sex has gone so wrong, you only have to look back to Adam and Eve and, and see how it first got messed up in the first place. What did they do? They ate the fruit that God had told them not to eat. They disobeyed God's limits. And in doing so, they chose the creation over the creator. They took the gift and they made it their God. And their children did over time. Fast forward to today, we still have the same inclination in our nature too, to take what God gives to us as a gift and to transform it into a God, to worship it, to obey it, to do what it says more than what the creator says. And when we take all of these things and we give them too much power, we effectively worship them. We turn them into little gods, small g, gods. We idolize them. One author put it like this. It says that everyone in the world worships. No matter your religion, everyone worships. The only choice we get is what we will worship. Romans, Paul talks about this, this idolatry, which is just the name for turning something into a god. And after setting the scene in Romans chapter 1, 23, he says this, he says, therefore God gave them over to the sinful desires of their heart, to sexual impurity, 
for the degrading of their bodies with another, and they exchanged the truth about God for a lie, they worshipped and served created things rather than the Creator. There it is, that's what we're talking about. They served and worshipped created things rather than the Creator. Notice what the first idolatry here is that Paul talks about, sexual impurity which I think is pretty telling to say that this is one of the main places we stuff it up. Something so powerful and so bonding and so beautiful can actually be turned into something so destructive. And in the context of this time, the letter was written nearby, actually, in another city. There was a temple to Aphrodite. She's the goddess of sexual love. And historians and accounts and records will tell us that in this temple, people would go there and they would sleep with the prostitutes in order to worship and to proclaim their love. And essentially, they were coming from all over the region to have sex with someone that they'd barely met. Well, as it was back then, can you not see that same spirit continuing today? That the, the spirit, the worship of sex, the worship of Aphrodite is still alive and well. It's a multi-billion dollar industry around the world from porn, to fashion, to fitness, to raunchy movies, to cosmetics, plastic surgery. The worship of sex is all around us. The worship of sexuality is all around us. And these things aren't ever easy to please. The problem is the idols, the stuff that we worship demands everything from us, demands everything to follow them. And some of you will know that feeling. You've had to give up way too much give up way too much of your dignity and your purity in order to worship and appease this small g God. See, here's the problem. When we turn sex, when we take it as a gift and we turn it into a God, what was originally supposed to be a gift has now turned into an addiction, something that we're enslaved to, something that has a strange supernatural power that you can't break free from. When sex is your God, it rules you. When sex is your God, you have to download porn. When sex is your God, you have to go to secret places and be intimate, pleasure yourself. When, when sex is your God, you have to go to those places with your boyfriend or girlfriend. You can't help it. You've got no choice because you've become a slave. And a lot of us think that we're free. We think we're free because we can choose whatever we want and we can do whatever we want. That's probably not freedom. That's probably actually slavery. When Jesus defines freedom, he doesn't talk about it as do whatever you want with whoever you want, however you want. Freedom to Jesus is having the capacity to do whatever you should, to be able to take every good gift from God and not be enslaved to it, but to use it, to enjoy it, to delight in it without it ever controlling you. And this is why Jesus' message is good news. This is why every single one of us, married, single, whatever we find ourselves in today, we need the king who comes to set the captives free. Jesus is the truth and his truth about sex will set us free. If I could pray one prayer over every person listening to this today, it would be that you would put Jesus Christ back on the throne. You would dethrone sex where it's become too powerful, where it started to enslave you and you would allow it to take its proper place under Jesus. Because then you could start to enjoy God's creation without being enslaved to it. From the chaos, the pain of sex, running wild outside of God's limits, you could start to see sex as what it is, a beautiful gift from God, rightly to be enjoyed with a lifelong partner in the most intimate, beautiful way. Now, I've spoken a lot to married couples. Can I just speak to all the single people out there, where are you? All the people saving themselves, all of the people who are feeling just alone and you're trying so hard to live a life of purity. There's really good news for you too. See, sex is a good gift, but sex is not ultimate. Sex was never an ultimate thing. Sex is not something that you need for a happy, secure, satisfied life. If you're feeling lonely, if you're feeling like you're missing out, wondering if you'll ever get to experience this thing that other people are talking about, sex is good, but it's never ultimate. Jesus never had sex. Jeremiah never had it. John the Baptist, Elijah, the Apostle Paul, probably for most of his life, never had it. The Apostle Paul actually goes on and he wished that more people were celibate. That's 
a, a sex-free life, a pure life, without any other sexual relations. He, he wished that more people were like him. Can you imagine that? He's actually desiring more people. Why? So that you'd have the freedom to serve God, to travel the world, to live your life for the glory of Jesus. He's actually longing and praying for that for people without all of those pressures of neglecting your family. God gives the gift of marriage to some. He also gives the gift of singleness to others. The, the issue I think at the heart of all of this is really what Emma's been touching on in the last few weeks. But the issue is this, we define ourselves too much by our sexuality. We define ourselves with who we have sex with, how often we have sex. We, we define ourselves by these things, but really we don't define ourselves by what we should, which is our value in Jesus. Before sex, before relationships, you already have your ultimate value and satisfaction in Jesus Christ. You already have maximum value. You are already blessed with every spiritual blessing. You're already an image bearer of God before you brought sex into the picture. Sex is a good gift, but it is never ultimate and is not required for a satisfying, happy life in God. So whether we're married, single, dating, any of the above, whatever you find yourself in today, maybe you've been betrayed, maybe you have baggage, maybe there's abuse, whatever it is, our prayer is that the good news of Jesus and his view on the world could redeem sex and sexuality back into its proper place. And perhaps today, for you, sex does have painful baggage. Maybe there's some deeply hurtful things that have happened to you. You see sex as stained and dirty. And as we're talking about the good gift of what sex could be, it just does not make sense to you. I pray that Jesus would heal you. I pray that you'd open up your heart and you'd allow Jesus to redeem your life. There is nothing uh, too great, too stained, too far that the blood of Jesus cannot heal. You can be clean and set free. In fact, next week, uh, I'd love you to tune in again. We're going to be talking about how to heal from sexual sin. If that's happened to you, how your life can be redeemed and you can be set free. Perhaps you today, sex has become everything. And like we've said, it is just an insatiable appetite. Maybe it's an addiction that needs to be broken. Maybe it's just something you can't stop thinking about day and night. I pray that you'd come back to Jesus and see him as the giver of every good thing for your enjoyment. He's not trying to hold back life from you. He's trying to bring joy, life, peace, wholeness to you. And as you put Jesus back on the throne and see him as the king, Jesus and no other earthly thing, then you'll become free to enjoy every good gift that Jesus brings. Every good thing, every tobe, every beautiful, delightful, pure, wonderful thing from God. And all of the purity and the delight and the blessing of God that will go along with it. Let me pray for you. God, I thank you for the good gifts that you've given to us, sex included. I thank you for the wonderful, beautiful, delightful world that you've made. And God, I pray that as we put you back in first place and have everything else submit and bow down to you, we will experience the blessing, the delight, the purity and the wholeness of God in our life. We pray that our lives would glorify you and that we would see sex as a good gift from our God in heaven. We pray for your blessing, your peace, and your goodness on our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, God bless you guys. Love to see you in person sometime. Come down and join us at our community. We'd love to meet you and say hello. Hey, if you've enjoyed this message, check out for more on our Hope City KL YouTube and podcast channels. For those who want to know more about Jesus, find a Christian community to be part of, or if you're exploring the faith, why don't you join us this coming Sunday for our 11 a.m. service? We are a growing, vibrant church in the heart of Petaling Jaya in Malaysia, and we have interactive kids program for 2 to 12. We have facilities for parents with under 2, and we've got freshly brewed coffee or tea available for 30 minutes before each service. We're so confident that you're going to leave feeling encouraged. To find out more on our website, hopecity.my, or follow us on Instagram or Facebook right now. We can't wait to host you.